Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 15th annual Bio CEO and Investor Conference. I'm Celia Economides, Director of Investor Relations and Programs at Bio. It's my pleasure to introduce this morning's first session, a uh, fireside chat with Tony Coles. Uh, moderating the session will be Steve Usden, who's a senior editor at BioCentury. Steve has spent the last 20 years in the nation's capital covering political and policy issues affecting the life sciences sector. He's also the host of BioCentury This Week, which is BioCentury's weekly public affairs television program, as well as the senior editor responsible for coverage of social issues involving biotech. And we'll do Q&A with the audience maybe the last five, ten minutes. Sounds good. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. I'm going to do an extremely brief introduction for uh, Tony because I'm sure you all um, know who he is and, uh, and Onyx's amazing story. Uh, if you didn't, you wouldn't be here at 7.45 in the morning. Uh, uh, so um, Onyx has had a spectacular year. It's gone uh, in the last year from a, a one drug company, or you could say even a half a drug company, next of our partner with Bayer, in two indications, to three different drugs in, what, five or six indications now. Um, Tony, proved, uh, Tony and Onyx proved a lot of skeptics wrong when Kyprolis for multiple myeloma received accelerated approval based on a phase 2B trial. Um, what's also interesting to me about that, and I hope we can talk about it today, is that, uh, that the EMA hasn't approved uh, Kyprolis and that they're actually requesting um, a larger full outcomes trial. So it shows a, um, a distinction between the FDA and the EMA that's interesting to explore. And, and in my opinion, doesn't apply to the entire FDA, and, and people uh, make the mistake sometimes of, of making that uh, broad kind of assumption. Uh, in addition to uh, Kyprolis, there's Stig Stavarga. Stavarga, I'll say that right next time, um, which is partnered with Bayer um, and was approved last year for metastatic uh, colorectal cancer. And the flow of news is going to continue this year. Um, Kyprolis could be exp have a, an expanded indication as a result of a couple of ongoing trials. Um, data and multiple myeloma from oprosumib is, uh, is due uh, in oral um, proteos proteosome inhibitor. And um, there's a PDUFA date coming up for Cy Cygarva uh, in GIST in um, gastrointestinal cancer for uh, Gleevec uh, refractory patients. Uh, and then there's also data coming up on PD-991, uh, a drug that Onyx has partnered with Pfizer in uh, breast cancer. There's been some extremely interesting data about that that Tony's going to want to talk about. Um, you know, you all probably know all of what I've just said. What you probably don't know um, is that Tony is also extremely active um, uh, publicly and behind the scenes uh, in Washington uh, in um, policymaking and in influencing policymaking on Capitol Hill um, and, and at FDA and, um, and has uh, played an extremely positive and um, an active role there, which is quite interesting. I, I want to start, uh, Tony, with um, so, some of the news, I think, uh, one of the things that people are interested in especially is um, how you see the multiple myeloma space evolving. There was last week's, or this week's, I guess, uh, approval of um, Celgene's uh, drug, which uh, could, could compete with Kyprolis. Um, you've got your own drug that's coming up. There are a lot of other drugs in the pipeline. W where do you see, uh, years now from time from now, two years time from now, the multiple myeloma market evolving? Well, good, good morning, Steve, and good morning, everyone. Um, I, if I, as I think about the multiple myeloma market, uh, there are a couple of things that strike us. First of all, uh, this is a market that on a global basis uh, is just about $5 billion today, and we project will grow to 8 to $9 billion by 2016 or 17. So lots of growth ahead, almost effectively doubling the size of the market. Uh, if you think about the current therapies that are uh, used, Velcade, Revlimid, Thalamid, uh, mostly in Europe, and some of the older cytotoxic agents, uh, each of those agents has made uh, substantial improvements in the treatment of patients, but none of them are, are, can cure a myeloma patient. And what we found this summer with the approval of Kyprolis, and more recently with the approval of Pomalist, is that this significant unmet need, especially in the advanced stages of myeloma, uh, remains and uh, additional therapies are still needed. So I suspect that both with the advancing age of the population, the increasing numbers of uh, new therapies, this market will be fueled with growth. We're actually uh, quite happy for patients that uh, Pomalist has just received approval. Uh, as I've mentioned, there is no cure. This disease is unfortunately uniformly fatal. So patients are going to need all the, all the help that they can get uh, in years to come. And do and you imagine that um, Kyprolis and Pomalist will be used 
uh, one after another, or they'll be used one or the other, or will they potentially be used in combination? Well, uh, we suspect that there is uh, room for both therapies uh, in this advanced population. There are about 10 to 15,000 Americans uh, each year who would be eligible patients for our, uh, these therapies. They'd be the advanced myeloma patients who failed everything. Uh, what our market research suggests is that both therapies will be used uh, by physicians. Uh, you know that uh, pomalist is used in combination with dexamethasone, and uh, Kyprolis has been uh, available for now for almost eight months. So physicians have a very good history with uh, Kyprolis, understand the safety profile, and understand the benefit and the efficacy profile. Physicians also tell us that they are likely to use both therapies in combination, and indeed we have some investigator sponsor trials with both therapies uh, together to understand the efficacy. Uh, what's quite interesting is that in early, uh, uh, early returns from one of the investigative sponsored trials, these two therapies together have an additive benefit. And you can imagine that if an IMID, such as pomalist or revlimid, and a, board, uh, and a uh, proteasome inhibitor are used together, uh, that you could actually have a greater efficacy, and that's what we're hoping to achieve in the advanced patient. And, and can you talk a little bit about the timelines of your studies and when we're likely to see results of them that are intended to expand the Kyprolis indication in uh, multiple myeloma to earlier stage patients and to less refractory patients? Sure. Let me start with Europe, which is where, uh, in, in one of your introductory comments, you made the point about approval in Europe. Uh, Europe does not have uh, an equivalent accelerated approval pathway uh, uh, on the basis of single arm data, uh, such as we have here in the United States. Uh, they do have uh, uh, accelerated pathways, but most of them require randomized comparative data. And that's exactly what we're attempting to get with the FOCUS study, which is the exact same population as the subject of the U.S. approval, except those data are randomized, uh, randomizing Kyprolis versus best supportive care or standard of care in that advanced population. Uh, once the FOCUS trial is complete, that could form the basis of the European registration or should form the basis of the European registration, and we expect to have interim results pot potentially in the fourth quarter or the second half of uh, this year. Also supporting global registration is the ASPIRE study. So the first indication for Kyprolis is in the advanced myeloma patient following failures with Velcade and uh, Revlimid. Uh, the next earlier step will the relapse population, patients who've had one to three prior therapies, uh, is the subject of the ASPIRE study. So the ASPIRE study is just under 900 patients. It's being conducted worldwide, and it's, re it's comparing uh, uh, Revlimid and Dexamethasone versus Kyprolis, Revlimid, and Dexamethasone. And it will give us some very important information. Either of these two studies could support European registration and broader global registration uh, on the basis of uh, the randomized data we'd expect to get. And then there are two other trials very quickly, a head-to-head -head comparison with Velcade in that relapsed setting of one to three prior therapies, and in the very earliest setting, the front line or the newly diagnosed patients. We plan a head-to-head -head trial against Velcade that will start later this year. So I want to ask you something that, uh, it's, a, it's about Kyprolis, but I think it probably applies to all of your products, uh, or will down the line, which is about pricing. Um, when you priced Kyprolis, <coughs> did you price it with the anticipation that the market, that the indication might grow, like? like we're discussing now, the number of patients who might be able to get it might grow, and that the pricing would stay the same? Or is there a possibility that as the, the, um, as the price, as the market size expands uh, and possibly dosing changes, that pricing will also change? We uh, priced the Kyprolis uh, very thoughtfully, very carefully uh, following uh, conversations with physicians, conversations with payers, and looked at the value that Kyprolis brought to patients uh, in terms of response rate, in terms of uh, the overall benefit in this advanced population. I uh, believe that it's priced at exactly the right uh, level, uh, and uh, the market certainly is embracing that. We've got reimbursement coverage in the United States across all of the Medicare account carriers, uh, and uh, have not had uh, any difficulty with reimbursement from insurance companies. I think because of the advanced, uh, the advanced stage of these patients, that the, the therapy has been broadly adopted. Uh, inherent in your question is, I think, a question about what happens if we uh, look at other doses, for instance, which we are. In the head-to-head -head trial against uh, Velcade, uh, the Endeavor trial in the relapsed setting, we are looking at nearly double the dose. 
And I think once we have those findings, look at those results, we'll actually take a step back and examine the pricing structure for Kyprolis and uh, really understand what's the most appropriate way for us to deliver this therapy to patients. The good news is that patients who are uninsured or underinsured can get access to Kyprolis through the Onyx 360 program. So for patients who have uh, limited affordability, uh, we, are, we are so committed to them getting the therapy that we provide that support for those patients and for Medicare patients uh, as well through a foundation. So, so sticking with Kyprolis for a few more minutes, uh, my understanding is that, that your intention is to market Kyprolis on your own in five, the five big countries in Europe uh, and then to seek uh, partnerships and distributors for other, <coughs> other areas. And I'm wondering how you look at Europe now. I, I'm hearing a lot from people of concerns about the technology assessment process, which by the way in, in the UK uh, isn't allowing Nexavar um, to be used on the NHS. Um, and I'm hearing a lot about um, difficulties in reimbursement and so on. H how do you look at the European market and is it, is it worth it um, putting your resources in pursuing that? Uh, given that we have uh, no substantial business uh, with Kyprolis in Europe, uh, any uh, incremental benefit we can bring to patients or incremental dollar we can generate in that market uh, is, is well worth our effort. So this is a, a very important strategic investment for us. Uh, certainly a number of larger companies have shrinking businesses and so they've got to find growth to offset that in other markets around the world. We substantially today have no business uh, in Europe because Caprolis isn't approved yet as we mentioned. And so anything above what we have today would be, would be quite important and I think beneficial for patients most importantly. Uh, we think about Europe in a couple of ways. Uh, the, the core markets in Europe, the, the so-called Big Five, uh, if you will, some people argue whether the United Kingdom remains in the Big Five given the, the, some of the recent reimbursement discussions. But for sake of the conversation, let's leave it in. And it's Germany, France, Spain, Italy, and the United uh, Kingdom. Uh, each of those markets is still a very valuable market. They each have their challenges in terms of balancing healthcare access with some of the other government priorities, but they're still important markets. And in aggregate, Europe represents about 50,000 myeloma patients uh, uh, in comparison to the United States, which is somewhere around 40,000 uh, or so. So it's about the same size opportunity. Uh, it's an important opportunity, and obviously patients there are advancing with myeloma and don't have any uh, treatment uh, possibilities. In those five markets, we'll, we will commercialize as Onyx. It's easily scalable for us. Uh, the number of treating uh, oncologists and prescribers is relatively focused and contained mostly in the hospital setting. So there's a lot of uh, scale and leverage that we can take advantage of. Outside of the big five, we are expecting to work with local partners. And this is a strategy that's tried and true in the hematology and oncology field has worked very nicely. Uh, across uh, the industry, and that's the strategy that we'll employ there. So it will be a mix of Onyx-led uh, sales and local partner-led sales. And, and can you say anything about how you're approaching the technology assessment process in Germany, for example, in the UK? One of the uh, key things that we've done is to hire a very small core leadership team uh, in our offices uh, in Switzerland, in Zug, Switzerland. Uh, one, uh, two of the members of that team are focused on exactly that, uh, the preparation of the reimbursement dossier, which is a key part of the European uh, uh, commercial pro process. Uh, that, of course, needs to be started early, and uh, we already have that work underway uh, in expectation of positive data down the road and in the launch in Europe. I, I want to stay on the international theme, but switch sure. to a different one of your drugs, to Anexavar. Um, I think part of your challenge now is to grow Nexavar, uh, and, and one of the ways that you're growing it is in liver cancer, and I imagine if you're looking at liver cancer, you must be looking at Asia, because that's where there's this huge unmet need. First, is, is that the case, and second, how, if it is, how are you going about it? So it, uh, you're, you're exactly correct, and so let's, uh, let's set the stage uh, uh, from a demographic point of view in liver cancer. So liver cancer uh, occurs in about 15,000 Americans, and what's quite interesting is that if you compare that to the instance in South Korea, for instance, it's about the same. So for a country that's uh, much smaller than the United States, the incidence of liver cancer uh, is, uh, is much higher. Japan represents about 40,000 cases, and China itself represents about 340,000 cases, or over half of the world's incidence of liver cancer in, in China all due to the uh, correlation between hepatitis, both B and C, with liver cancer. 
and we know that hepatitis has been endemic in that part of the world. And on that basis, 20 to 25 or 30 years later, which is the amount of time it takes, uh, liver cancer has, has been one of the sequelae of uh, hepatitis. Uh, so we have uh, concentrated our efforts through our partner, Bayer, in that part of the world. Uh, Nexvar is now approved uh, for uh, liver cancer in South Korea, in uh, Taiwan, in Japan, uh, in China, pardon me, <clears throat> in China as, uh, as well. And uh, that is a rapidly growing part of the world uh, for the partnership with Bayer on a sales basis. So we have, unlike the comments about Kyprolis, we have actually seen some contraction in the European business. Uh, the U.S. continues to grow on a demand basis. Europe's contracted slightly. But the Asia-Pacific emerging markets and Latin American markets continue to grow very, very nicely. And uh, Bayer is one of the top pharmaceutical companies in China, particularly, and have done a really nice job in unlocking the potential there. And when you say, just quickly, when you say that the that you've seen um, the market shrinking in Europe. Is that because of the um, technology assessment process or the, the difficult reimbursement environment there? It, it's really more the difficult reimbursement env environment. Um, many of the countries, uh, Spain notably, Germany also, have contracted their pricing for the industry and taken uh, mandatory discounts in many cases. Uh, and that is literally effectively what's shrinking the opportunity. Before we move on to some, some other things, then, can you then quickly highlight the other elements of your, your kind of your news flow that you're expecting um, for, for 2013. Sure. If we, if we just tick them off uh, much the way you did, uh, we'll start with Kyprolis. We've talked about the focus study that could be uh, available to us in the second half of this year uh, uh, for interim results. The Aspire study, the relapsed study I mentioned for Kyprolis, comparing Kyprolis Revdex to Revdex, could be available as early as the fourth quarter of this year with interim results. Uh, we will also initiate the head-to-head -head study in the newly diagnosed patients, comparing Velcade to Kyprolis. So there's a lot on the plate for uh, Kyprolis in addition to advancing the, the U.S. launch, which, while in its early days, exceeded everyone's expectations with more than $62 million in sales since the launch uh, in uh, late July. Uh, for Nexavar, we uh, have recently reported the thyroid cancer data where the study, the decision study, met the primary endpoint of improving progression-free survival in, in thyroid cancer patients. They're the differentiated thyroid cancer patients, which represent about 95, 90 to 95% of the, the uh, opportunity. And then for, uh, uh, also for Nexavar, the resilience study. It's a breast cancer study that compares Nexavar and capecitabine or Zolota. Uh, to Zolota and placebo alone uh, should complete enrollment this year. That had some really wonderful phase two data uh, a couple of years ago where there was a 74% improvement in overall survival and we're trying to replicate that in the phase three trial. And then finally for Stavarga, uh, we uh, have received approval for colorectal cancer in the United States, are expecting uh, uh, approval for GIST uh, gastrointestinal stromal tumor. Quite soon, yeah. Also uh, in the United States, that's got a PDUFA action date uh, that's coming up shortly. And then regulatory filings are underway both in Europe and Japan uh, with decision dates expected uh, between now and the middle of the year for colorectal cancer. Uh, so we've got fast track in Japan, uh, so that therapy's uh, off uh, to a running start. Uh, the nice thing is that Bayer are investing additional dollars in other phase three studies in second-line liver cancer after next of our failures and in other colorectal cancer uh, settings uh, for patients with liver metastases after surgery. So this is one that should have a broad uh, uh, development program globally and a strong life cycle uh, plan. Uh, the one thing I'd love to mention uh, before we uh, finish with the pipeline is pal palbociclib, uh, which is uh, formerly known as PD-991. It's the I Pfizer. I like PD-991. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll go with PD-991. It's the Pfizer uh, therapy that uh, really did uh, take the breast cancer world by storm at San Antonio Breast uh, in December. Uh, very exciting uh, new therapy, potentially first in class, CDK4-6 uh, inhibitor. Uh, and it's the byproduct of an Onyx and Pfizer research collaboration many years ago. Uh, that has uh, really, really uh, uh, come on the scene in a very nice way and will earn a single-digit royalty uh, from that. Uh, I think with expectations from a, a number of folks that that's a therapy that's desperately needed for breast cancer patients. And that's for ER positive? HER2 negative, ER positive, yeah, that's yeah. correct. Um, so 
all, all of what you said, there's an, an enormous number of moving pieces. Most of these pieces are very late in the, in the, in the pipeline. Uh, does that suggest that you might be looking um, either through acquisitions or through uh, licensing to bring some other things in earlier in the pipeline? So uh, we, we have been as, uh, I think, as successful as Onyx has been to date on the basis of uh, two things. One, being willing to use a mix of collaborations and uh, our own proprietary therapies to build a business and moving the business very rapidly from, as you mentioned, from half a product or one therapy at the beginning of 2012 to three therapies uh, in uh, more than certainly four indications marketed and two others where we've got great phase three data and more data coming. I think uh, we have to continue to be opportunistic. I think that if we think across the entire span of development, from preclinical through phase one and phase two, if there are attractive oncology assets, we'd be very interested in considering those to expand the pipeline for the company. You know that we don't have internal discovery. And as a result, all of our external research has to come from, uh, from license opportunities, options, acquisitions of products. Uh, we really are trying to broaden everyone's understanding that a transaction could take any of these forms. It could be a license for a product. It could be a product uh, that we purchase, an option deal. And we've done each one of those things in the past. And, that, and that's a really good segue for something that else I wanted to ask you about, and that actually we did a whole uh, television program about, and I hope people look at the BioCentury website and watch the television program. But it, it was about this idea of collaboration. Yes. Your company's really, that's what it's, it's based on. Is you, you know, it's, and everybody knows about the collaborations that you've done with Bayer, with, with Pfizer. Um, but the interesting thing to me is, is that you've also done a lot of collaborations, really been a pathbreaker in collaborating with patient advocacy organizations. Yes. And I, and I want to ask you about that. What are those, what's different about um, those kinds of collaborations? How important are they? And, and what should investors think about um, for the future of, of, especially of cancer drug development, in terms of collaborations with patients? Well, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd use a couple of examples, uh, if I might. Um, if you think about how difficult it is to actually discover and develop a drug, you can easily see that no one company, no one person has the perfect solution. And so we've found, I think, the opportunity to create success through these kinds of partnerships. Let's uh, look at the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation for, for just a moment. Uh, one of the leading uh, myeloma disease-based uh, patient engagement groups uh, they were instrumental in uh, launching our compassionate use or expanded access program in the United States prior to Kyprolis' approval last summer. Uh, we funded uh, the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. They conducted the entire program, including identifying patients, bringing them in through their centers, their research sites, et cetera. And uh, they really did live their mission of uh, trying to deliver therapies to, uh, to patients. And that was a really crucial partnership because Onyx didn't have the infrastructure to actually deliver that uh, in an expeditious uh, way. Uh, we've also funded their personal genomics project, which is uh, taking uh, the serum samples from each of the patients with myeloma and uh, independent of the therapy they're on, warehousing and banking these data to try to correlate genomic profile of patients with therapeutic benefit or outcome. And, and, and one a, of the interesting things to me about that is you're funding it but you don't have control of that data, right? They've, they've got it. This is a pre-competitive uh, arrangement. So uh, other, other companies are involved. Millennium's involved, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, and is uh, helping to sponsor this particular uh, research study. And we like the pre-competitive notion because there are so many unanswered questions on behalf of patients that with some collaboration across companies, independent of commercial interests, we can make big improvements in uh, the treatment for the disease, and that's what we're hoping uh, in this case. So we've, that's just one example. I'll mention quickly our Onyx 360 program, because the Onyx 360 program is a program not only which provides uninsured and underinsured patients access to the therapy, but it also provides them with psychosocial support in uh, the treatment of their cancer, with transportation services, with counseling services, and that's done in partnership also with patient engagement groups. The uh, cancer support uh, uh, group is our partner for the Onyx uh, 360 program. And we found that we can expand our reach and amplify our impact through these kinds of partnerships. So they've been, they've been very valuable, and patients have really, really appreciated these efforts. So, so as, you move, as, as you move beyond 
as companies move beyond thinking about selling a pill or a vial and into selling healthcare, that those kinds of relationships are going to be really important. I think they're crucial. And, and they're not just the patient engagement relationships, they're the, the company relationships where there's a therapeutic uh, opportunity to share, but also engagement and uh, partnerships with the government, with the FDA, with the NIH, uh, and, and in other ways, so that we can answer some of the more fundamental questions that are still perplexing the industry these days. And before you were at Onyx, I know you were at Vertex. Yes. And, and Vertex is kind of the poster child for another form of patient engagement for venture philanthropy, for the CF Foundation, really driving the, the development of Kaleidico. Josh Boger said many times that it wouldn't have happened without them. Do you think, is that um, kind of proof of concept of something that we might see more of, or was that a one-off kind of magical thing that happened? No, I, I think, uh, I think it's, it's certainly not one-off, because I would, uh, again, give credit to the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation for a very similar approach. Uh, while the cystic fibrosis uh, relationship with Vertex was largely organized around basic science and uh, the uh, grant from the CF Foundation to Vertex, it was then expanded uh, into a development program. Same things happened with the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation and Onyx. Uh, the, the engagement with them started back in 2007 or 8. And uh, with uh, the use of their clinical trial network, which is spread throughout the United States, so the involvement there really did help us to enroll patients much faster, identify the appropriate sites and the high prescribers or those who have large patient populations. So at least two examples where patient engagement and dollars have been directed towards research to accelerate the availability of a therapy to market. And I'm sure that it's going to be a model for others. I want to switch gears a little bit then back to, to, to Washington. Okay. Uh, I know that you were up on the Hill recently with, um, with Francis Collins, with um, Peggy Hamburg talking about um, drug development and in, in the context of budget sequestration. The White House put out a statement recently saying that if budget sequestration happens, um, FDA reviews are going to be delayed and um, some of the activities under PDUFA 5 that are supposed to improve the efficiency of drug development uh, will also be delayed. D is that a concern for you? And, and, and if it is, do you think that the industry should be doing more um, to try to, um, to avert it? It's an important concern for a couple of reasons. Let's take Nexavar as an example. We've talked about how Nexavar is treating hundreds of thousands of patients around the world today. Well, very few people know that Nexavar was actually the byproduct of a total of 41 NIH research grants. So if you stop and think a moment that if we had not had any of those 41 research grants, and not to overstate the point, it's quite possible that this could be a world without Nexavar and still antiquated therapies for liver cancer, since Nexavar was the first significant improvement in the treatment of liver cancer in 30 years. It'll be the first, if it receives approval, new treatment for thyroid cancer, for differentiated thyroid cancer in 30 years. So when you think about the relationship between basic science that's largely publicly supported in this country and therapies that actually do benefit patients, there's a clear linkage between the two with the FDA right there in the middle adjudicating and reviewing files to assess risk and benefit. Uh, the nice thing is that there's been this wonderful partnership between the academy and industry in delivering these therapies, and it would be a shame to, to see that interrupted in, in any way. If the NIH doesn't receive its funding, if FDA doesn't receive its funding, good grief if uh, the FDA even has the uh, PDUFA funding. Uh, included as part of the sequestered cuts, which is the way that it's which going is to go the now. conversation yeah. uh, now, and yeah. and, uh, and really illogical in a lot of ways. Uh, that would really be uh, devastating to the industry. So our role last week in helping lawmakers understand this was all about the ecosystem that we are involved in, the tight partnerships across each one of these things, and how you really do need uh, various stakeholders to bring these new therapies forward. I think, I think we're running up on our last 10 minutes. If anybody has questions, they're welcome to come to the mic or shout out from a seat. Thank you for taking my questions. I have uh, two questions regarding the, um, it's called royalty-bearing products. A little bit louder, if you don't mind. If we can turn his microphone up, that'd be great. You, you hear me now? That's yes, okay. that's better. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So, I look at the, the number of phase two that Pfizer is running on CDK um, in solid tumors. It looks like there's at least six, seven indication 
Um, one of them, of course, landslide victory in breast cancer, but also ovarian glioblastoma, multiple myeloma, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So you know the drug very well. What do you think, uh, mechanism-wise, could be um, eligible for the market? And right now they're pricing the drug at about $2 billion peak sales. If what needs to happen for it to be like a real winner, a four or five billion dollar drug. And regarding Rego, um, in terms of timelines and probabilities, uh, moving it to um, second, first line in colorectal and geese, um, what would that take in terms of timelines, in terms of sales potential? Uh, how big could that be? Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to repeat both questions just to make sure that I, I heard them. I think the first one was about the Pfizer therapy and uh, Pfizer's intent to study it in other tumor indications and what would it take for it to be a, a, uh, a top seller. Uh, I forget the numbers you threw out. So I'm not going to speculate on sales forecasts, but, uh, and I'll only focus my comments on breast cancer, which is the, the therapy that's most, or the indication that's most advanced for this, this compound. Uh, these data, f first of all, significant unmet need in breast cancer, and we know that and we can see that. HER2 negative cases, which account for 75% of the cases of breast cancer, still don't have a very good standard of care because of the diversity of the disease and uh, while we have improved overall mortality, we still need new therapies. Uh, there are a number of projections that would actually uh, suggest that lots of women would benefit from this particular therapy. Uh, we are expecting that and banking on that, and the, the data that we've seen are, are so impressive at the phase two level that we've got high hopes for that uh, particular therapy. So I, I won't speak to the other indications, and we'll let Pfizer come forward with their plan when they're ready. For Stavarga, and I think your question was in other indications behind uh, GIST and uh, third or fourth line colorectal, which are the two that are most current, uh, the plans are for patients who have hepatocellular carcinoma after Nexavar failure to study those patients in phase three and also to study other colorectal cancer patients. There is a phase two frontline colorectal cancer trial that is ongoing. Results haven't been, uh, uh, the study's not complete, and results haven't been announced. But also in colorectal cancer, a number of patients, as you know, have metastases to the liver. And part of the treatment is not only standard uh, cytotoxic and or targeted therapy, but also resection of those liver metastases. That population is not inconsequential, and that's going to be the second target phase three opportunity for Stavarga uh, after the hepatocellular carcinoma study that I just mentioned. So we've got at least two. Uh, there are uh, opportunities potentially in gastric cancer and others, and those are being studied right now by, by Bayer. Thank you. Any other questions? So I'll, I'll ask you another one while people are collecting their thoughts. Sure. Um, I, want, I wanted to ask you, and it's a kind of an extension of what we were talking about before, which is about the sustainability of pricing for oncology drugs, and not just oncology drugs, but for orphan drugs and ultra-orphan drugs in particular. Do you think that the current pricing um, levels in the United States are sustainable, uh, especially in light of the, um, the fact that the Affordable Care Act is going to come into effect next year? there's going to be increasing pressure on, on prices across the board in healthcare. Well, there's a, there's a broad spectrum of prices uh, uh, out there, uh, even for oncology drugs, from tens of thousands to, you know, over, over $100,000 on an annual basis. And I think one of the things we're going to have to examine is the, the absolute value that we return. The unfortunate part of the conversation is that there hasn't been enough time spent on the value side or the value equation, and I understand and hear it from my own parents when they go to pick up their prescriptions for hypertension, and diabetes, and the other things that confront us as we get older, that they have to shell out $300. And boy, that's a lot of money. And they're not happy about it. And that, yeah. they're not happy about it. And so I do understand that, but I will uh, remind them in that same conversation that these are therapies that are actually bringing benefit to them, preventing them from having other more critical sequelae comorbid conditions, and how can you actually put a price on what it could prevent for you for those chronic conditions? Same more so, perhaps, for cancer therapies, where the question is not the development of some debilitating condition, but death. But and, the, so, and the interesting thing to me, though, with cancer therapies is that the debate and a lot of the pushback on pricing is coming not from patients, it's coming from physicians. 
just, just the, the day before I got here, I got a, a packet about the upcoming ASCO meeting. And the first thing that fell out of the packet was a, a, a brochure that they have about managing the costs of um, cancer care. And then when I put that down, literally, I looked at my email, and there was an IOM report that came out um, yesterday, uh, and it was about the same topic. It was about managing costs of uh, drug costs, and it, um, there were people who were advocating in there for uh, cost effectiveness uh, criteria for approvals and things like that. That's not likely to happen in the short term, but, but the, there's this um, sense among clinicians, among oncologists, that something has to be done about pricing. Well, that, that shouldn't be a surprise to any of us, given the, the broader conversations we've been having since the economic crisis in 2008. And I think that crisis is putting into sharp relief a number of these topics uh, where we have to have a different kind of dialogue and discussion. So it's no surprise that as members of society, physicians are just as subject to, to those kinds of considerations, and that they'd be topics in the professional societies. What I hope we return to is a conversation about the importance of investing those dollars that we generate in new discoveries. Because I can tell you that Nexavar isn't here because of a, a grant uh, alone. It's not here because of the, of the largesse of an individual. It's here because the proceeds from other therapies actually made it possible and the support from the capital markets. So I think the conversation has to return to the reinvestment of dollars. Uh, we are at the point where uh, we are investing significantly in Kyprolis. Those contributions come from the cash flow that we generate from the kinase business, from Stavarga and from Nexavar, and then from support from the capital markets as evidenced by our recent uh, cash raise uh, a couple of weeks ago. That's, the, that's the, the value return, the promise of value return is what we have to stay focused on. And I think we'll find a solution on the pricing side. Any other? Okay, the question uh, for those in the back of the room is about, please talk about the bear collaboration from an economic point of view, talk about the profit split, the contribution of those therapies, and what we can expect on a margin basis. Um, we'll be reporting your end results, so you'll have all those details in just a couple of weeks, but let me uh, give you a high-level uh, view of uh, how we think about it. The kinase inhibitor business uh, is one of the two franchises that we have, the prednisone being Kyprolis and aprosumib, the oral therapy being the other. The kinase business is cash flow generating, and it's because we have focused uh, on investing in that business and now harvesting the opportunity to grow those sales uh, in important ways. The cash flow from the kinase inhibitor business is, uh, from Nexvar, is, off, is, is complemented by Stavarga royalties as well. So if you think about the commercial margins that we've gotten for the protozoan business, uh, kinase business, I'm sorry, for Nexvar in particular, where we, we are in the 60% range and have been for the last previous years. That's actually really good on a commercial margin basis. And all the substantial phase three investments are done for Nexavar. So we're moving into a different period, not only of um, uh, maturing growth, but also of increasing cash flow opportunity. And that's a 50-50 profit split with Bayer. Think about supplementing that, though, with the 20% royalty on net sales that we have from Stavarga, which for us is expense free. Bear makes all of the substantial R&D investments and commercial investments. So the kinase inhibitor business really is, uh, I call it an engine for our business. It really is an engine for our business and goes to offset some of the investments we're making in the proteasome business. And I think I see the clock ticking down to four seconds back there. <laughs> I think we've, our, our time is up unless anybody has a pressing um, quick last question. Okay. Okay. Oh, Thanks very much. Thanks, Steve.